Okay, let's talk about Quentin. Um, so, so obviously, like Quentin being alive and having his own chapter is something uh, we kind of knew that we wanted to do, but the placement of Quentin um, at this point in the story is mainly uh, the result of the order of um, George's chapters. You know, he did a he did a Victorian chapter, he did a Barristan chapter, then a Tyrian chapter. So that means the next one would be Barristan chapter and the next one would be a Tyrian chapter. And so you can't really have two Tyrian chapters in a row. So your choice is you can go another Barristan. You know, if you want to end, if you want to end the story on a Tyrian chapter, you know, you'd have to, uh, you'd have to then have either another Barristan, which I, you know, I didn't really see the need for, or another Victorian. And I actually think that like Victorian having more mystery going on with his chapter is more important. So how do you create a space in between Tyrion 2 and Tyrion 3? You need some other chapter in there because you don't want to split up the battle. Battle of the Blackwater was not split up. So that was the place for the Quentin chapter. Um, and that's kind of the birth of that. Um, um and then thinking about the Quentin chapter, just kind of say, okay, he's on the inside of Marine. He's a he's eyes on the inside of Marine. How is that going to work? Where is he going to be? Well, he's going to be in the pyramid. And then it just sort of kind of came from there, where oh, if he is in the pyramid, um, that's a, that's a lot like Bacalon, and that's a lot. You know, he is the. The, and at first, the, the chapter was called Man in the Pyramid, but one of the editors convinced me that doesn't it make more sense that it's Boy in the Pyramid, you know, the child back along. And plus, the, a lot of the chapter is about him being being this lost boy. Um, doesn't Boy in the Pyramid fit better? And so that's where it came from, the Boy in the Pyramid. It is a... Um, it just naturally became this this uh, callback to the Bravo chapter and Bacalon and being in that chapter, Sam had saw the Bravo and the Bravo being the being Bacalon in his, in his kind of visions um, as the hero that would save everybody. And in this Quentin has a lot of these kind of ideas as well. Like, is he the failed hero? Is he going to be the hero to save everyone? There's a lot of these these reoccurring themes of like, um, of being the person that can save everyone, being being the man in the pyramid, the boy in the pyramid, being being back along, <laughs> you know, um, the pale child. So, so that that's kind of where the title came from. It's a, it's a callback to it's a callback to Sam the the Bravo chapter. Um, I kind of knew from the beginning that I wanted to start start out shocking, and I'd come up with this line of beheading the children was folly. This now beheading the children had proved a folly, um, just as a, a sort of shocking way to bring you into the story. Um, and the thing is, like the 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 horror of war has already been at a pretty high level in the previous um, chapters with Tyrion and Barristan. So you kind of have to go, especially Barristan, you kind of have to go uh, a bit further and make things horrible again. And then it has to be kind of on the level. If things are going bad in Marine, Quentin is naturally going to think of Astapor. So it has to be you know, on the level of Astapor bad. And so execution of children is on the level of Astapor bad. So <laughs> this is where we kind of start. And so he kind of just, you know, describes this as a nightmare, the nightmare of Astapor, the fires he'd seen there, the fires he'd seen so often dreams. This is one of the things is when he's back in Astapor, he thinks like the fires, so many fires. Um, and so it's kind of a call back to that. But of course, like, you know, if you're thinking about the fires, like what fires are we talking about? The fires of, of getting burned by the dragon or the fires of Astapor. You have this conflation of these two kind of ideas. Which nightmare is he is he um, unable to awake from? You know, he'd escaped the flames. Um, 
his own screams jolting him awake, only this time he couldn't escape. He was already awake. You know, so you kind of get this idea that he's in the city now that's burning like Astapor and he can't escape because he's already awake. And the idea that he was he was already in those flames with the dragon, all the all the ideas that must be in his head um, and get the mother have mercy, which is going to be the reoccurring mantra throughout the, the chapter. It brings back kind of Davos sitting on the rock in um, a storm of swords and his connection with the mother. Um, Quentin having having a similar experience, also being kind of a a wreck like Reek and Theon at the beginning of a Dance with Dragons. In fact, like Reek, we don't say Quentin's name um, for quite a bit of the chapter until the dragon um, he thinks the dragon says his name, and then Quentin kind of comes back. So. Even though everybody kind of knew that this is a Quentin chapter, and especially if you're if you're a fan, everyone knew knew this was coming. Theoretically, someone could walk into this chapter and be like, "Who is this? Who are we talking about?" Because Quentin is not mentioned by name for a very long time. And then we get to kind of this poetic description of Marine um, and the and the violence there, trying to make it as horrible as possible beneath the, the smoke. Streets swelled with the fear of the Miranese, shouting curses, battling against the brazen beasts. Um, they clashed a dozen times today from East Gate to the West, East Gate to the West. So it does seem that like some time has passed since the the Tyrian chapters, uh, the Barristan and Tyrian chapters, which are were at dawn. There actually is a break in Tyrian two where um, they wait for Brown Ben to come all the way back from the from the. Um, the girl general. So some time has passed in the Tyrion chapter. So we're, we're, we're getting up to, you know, I would guess it's, you know, late morning, possibly noon for, for Quentin right now. Um, <clears throat> they'd clash a dozen times today, Eastgate to the West, the, um, the loudest climbers rose from the, uh, oh, by the way, the, the battle between like the brazen beasts and the, and the um, the Miranese. This is something a lot of fans have speculated on. I mean, Ska has, has been saying forever that he he um, he wanted to execute hostages. And so, what would be the city's reaction to that? And well, it would be chaos. You know, it just people wouldn't take it well. Um, and it just seems that this is the time for everything to fall apart. When everything is falling apart outside, why not have everything fall apart inside too? Okay, so the the loudest climbers rolled from rose from the Silk Quarter. We just kind of invented that as a as a place in Marine, and um, and here you can kind of follow the line. The, the the sentences flow into each other. So the beasts are cutting down looters, or perhaps they're merchants, and then the blood flows downhill, and then past the pyramid of Gazin. Just picked picked that randomly, and the treasures are being carted away over the corpses, and then the blood finally pools near the, the greatest spectacle, which was the burning of the Temple of the Graces, um, which is something that happens at Astapor as well. Um, and then the, the women uh, screaming because bad stuff is happening to them. It's being stripped of their colored robes and it's too much for Quentin, so he looks away and he goes to the Great Pyramid. There was actually more description of the city before and the Great Pyramid, but um, kind of all the things that weren't horrific were, were pared down. To, to kind of only leave the horrific stuff. Um, and so aside from the central plaza held all um, day by the brazen beasts, the only place free of fighting um, was the city's far south, which is free from people all together because the lions ruled there. Um, the lions being here is interesting because at the end of the Tyrian chapter, we actually have a dragon a dire wolf and a lion kind of all in the same location. Um, but these lions are, are heard about in, in the Barristan chapter that they were, that they were put, um, you know, in the golden pit, you know, that, uh, you know, different things for the, uh, the dragons to eat what they preferred, but you know, these, these animals have to be somewhere. So we put them in the golden pit. Um, and so then we had them, 
prowl near the pyramid of Paul, just kind of mentioning Paul. It could have been anybody's pyramid. And then we get a little a little Lannister reference here, because there's three there's three lions that are that are loose. Um, one has a mane of white and snow, flecked with blood. That's the idea that this lion is a Kingsguard, meaning Jamie. The other male he'd lost sight of, the lost lion is Tyrion. And then the lioness is lazing by Xerox's fountain. Uh, Jarak's fountain. Um, Jarak is an old hero of, of Marine. Um, he, uh, he was a f- uh, famous Giscari citizen ancestor of, of Hisdar. Um, stripping the meat of a young girl's body. So this idea is that Cersei is, you know, trying to strip the meat of, of, of Marjorie. But this is just a little, little inside joke of, of the Lannisters being referenced here. And then someone loosed them from the Golden Pit. You know, the Golden Pit is a real place, and it's probably where the. Um, I'm trying to think. Where, was that where the? Uh, uh, Yeah, so in the Queen's Hand chapter, um, they're trying to get food for the dragons to distract them from from eating people. Um, and he, he herded thousands of sheep in a Dasnex pit, filled the pit of Graz with, with bullocks, and the Golden Pit with the beasts that Hisdar Zoloric had gathered for his games. So this is where we know that the lions were gathered for the games because the lions were, were going to be used to, to, to kill Tyrion. Um, but then here they are. So, so someone has loosed them. But it's, it's just kind of ironic that, the, that it's the Golden Pit, like the Golden Lannisters. Anyway. Gods only knew why this could happen to cast the cruelty. The corpses flung over the walls. Um, kind of have to mention that the corpses are still coming over. Yes, who would loose such dangerous creatures? Was this all his fault? Um, oh, oh, I need to correct this. All his fault, his sin. That's oh, a little error there. Um, was he the rot at the root of the tree? Um, the rot at the root of the tree is a biblical reference. Um, I think it's from the book of Matthew. And um, the axe is now ready to cut down the tree at their roots. Every fruitless, rotten tree will be chopped will be chopped down and thrown into the fires. So this is the whole. It's a, it's a it's a reference to the book of Matthew because the rotten tree should be cut down and, and thrown into the fires, just like Quentin, um, and burned. Um, however, it's also like. This idea of that Quent, if Quentin, it's it's kind of a parallel to Bran being at the root of the trees, um, and and being the 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 person in the middle of everything that's controlling everything. So, if these branches are out and and all the things that are happening in the city um, are Quentin's doing, he's at the root of the tree. He's the rot at the root of the tree, and the rot at the root of the tree needs to be cut down and burned. <laughs> you know? But it's it, and it also kind of you know if we're also paralleling back to to Sam with the pyramid, um, he's he's you know the all powerful shut in kind of kind of reoccurring theme that that George R. R. Martin loves. But this line I th- I thought about it came to me pretty late, but this one I thought about a bit that about the Book of Matthew. Um, he had only watched from here through the mirrorish lens. This came from in one of the. Um, the idea that he's seeing everything through a mirish lens was was one of the um, contributions, one of the, uh, and that 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 came in and was such a good idea. I was like, oh right, because before Quentin's just on the on the parapet, like looking down, seeing everything. But it's like if you give him a mirish lens, then he has the chance to see everything. Plus, you're getting that parallel back to the prologue chapter um, with Maester John. So that's really great that 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 idea came in. Um, as soon as the gates were shut by, behind Sir Barristan, men in locust masks emerged from the Great Pyramid. The idea is that if you, in, a, in A Dance with Dragons, the idea is that the locust masks were the super, were the super loyal brazen beasts 
um, and the mult and the animal the multi animal masks were were from the the less so. So we know that the brazen beasts are made up of two parts. They're made up of freedmen and shave pates, and so we kind of get this idea that the super loyal men, the shave pates, are actually the the locusts and the freedmen who you know might like his dar but might not would would be the animals um and so the super loyal ones are the ones that go and and take down the children and of course you know they bring out the children and they take them to the process of purification and then here we 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 name some of the uh the children that we that we find in in um in a, in a dance with dragons these are um uh ter- um Daenerys's cupbearers and and all of these things are are true that Bakaz Lorak, Lorak is is the king's nephew Kismia and and Grejar Shai Mazara uh, I think was she, yeah I think she's described as Shai um, you know sometimes you forget if you like attribute something to her versus like yeah it says she's plump and shy so she, she's shy. And then we give her some lost milk teeth, um, you know, her baby teeth. We call her milk teeth. The rest of the names you've forgotten. But then we have a handsome boy, a girl who likes to sing. Um, there is there is one of the characters, one of the cupbearers does like to sing, and I forget which one. Um, and then, um, but not not too important. And then um, the boy with the green eyes is probably um, Gray Jar because the uh, the Green Grace's family has has great green eyes. But or wait, does Gray Jar? No, Gray Jar already dies up here, so I guess it can't be Gray Jar. Um, another another character with green eyes. It might have been in the. Yeah. Oh well, it's fine. It's actually kind of a more. I guess more than one more than one character can have green eyes. But I think originally it was supposed to be Greyjar because of green eyes. But it's okay that more than one character has green eyes. Um. None of them were. Not one of them was older than ten. He had forced himself to watch. And we just kind of wanted to make it sad. One boy struggled. One boy faced fate with bravery. The rest cried as the children they were. The headsman gets halfway through the line and then the the, the, uh, the crowd goes nuts. Um, then we kind of get the, like, like Tyrion's logic on things, um, which, uh, you know, it's not, <laughs> he's kind of, he's trying to figure it out, but it, his, his, his logic is a little weird because at first he's like, okay, it, because the Lorak boy was the first to die, it wouldn't be his dar. But then he immediately is like, so I guess it was the commander, but the commander is his dar's cousin. So he, it, it's the same reason that he would eliminate his dar. He should eliminate the commander. Obviously it was not um, either his dar nor his cousin. Um, but yes, his 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 um, his star's cousin it was the head of the Brazen Beasts um, before the coup, and so he doesn't know he, Quentin doesn't know that that Skahas has taken back the um, the Brazen Beasts because the coup happens the same night as as the um, as the the dragon um, theft attempt. Um, So he's kind of trying to think this through, and none of it makes sense. And he he, he doesn't he doesn't even consider that Skahas is in control. So the Westeros he has no kin here. Sir Barristan could have been his doing. Orders he gave out before riding, that made him shudder. No, impossible. Barristan the Bold would have never stood for the massacre of children. Now this is kind of. Um, his father had said as much. Would that man of honor been in the Red Keep? But alas, Sir Lewin, Sir Jonathan, or Sir Barristan had all been sent away. The thing is, Barristan, Barristan the Bold is kind of a person that just kind of sits back and doesn't do anything um, until his coup. Um, so it's kind of a funny thing for even him, him to be like, oh, Barristan wouldn't have stood for that. Barristan stood for a lot. You know, he stood by and let Ares do 
all sorts of crazy stuff. Then he just, then he just, you know, allows Robert to be king. Doesn't care that they murdered all of the the, the Targaryen children. Um, you know, uh, then you know lets a boar kill kill Robert. Like the guy is a man of inaction until the coup is the idea. So it's kind of a little joke here that that he would even think this about Barristan. And then we kind of get this like weird um line from from Doran where you know you can't trust anything Doran says. So you could you could possibly see Doran like making a show and saying like, oh if only a man of honor were there. Um of course Jamie Lannister was there. And I think that's a statement about Jamie Lannister, but he's saying Sir Lou and Sir Jonathan and Sir Barristan were all sent away. As if we haven't really heard anything good about about Sir Jonathor, you know, at all. Sir Lou and Barristan likes at least, but that's it. And so then we say they sent away. He swung the, the lens tube west and over the gates uh, were manned by a dozen brazen beasts, surveying the battles within and without. Below them, there were thrice as many standing sentry guarding the winch. Um, there was some discussion about what do the gates of Marine look like? And, you know, are they actually like, gates that come out with that are that have big posts to to keep them from opening or do they actually have like winches with a portcullis um and in truth george describes them both ways and so i guess they have both maybe you know but there is a portcullis mentioned in um the barristan sample chapter and so the idea is that these brazen beasts would be down below guarding the winch and Quentin figures out what's going on, that uh, they're not going to let Barristan back in the city. And so the realization was a disquieting one. Um, it's a very kind of George statement. Uh, Barristan had spoken of plots. Someone had tried to poison Daenerys and the knight had suspected the king. Yeah, so Barristan actually, there is a scene in the Barristan chapter where he explains all of this to Quentin. So if it, if anybody's wondering that like well, how Quentin knows all this information, well, Barristan goes and sends it, like tells him this stuff, this highly sensitive information. Um, but yeah, he says uh, someone tried to poison Daenerys, and he suspected the king. Um, so he's saying that some puppeteer worked his limbs and his tired eyes never saw the strings. Um, whoever whoever they were were, and these tired eyes are mentioned. Uh, in the Barristan chapter where he can't really see what the, the um, and he has to use um, Tumko's eyes to see kind of things far away. Um, the White Knight would die. And so this is, we're kind of like, this is more exposition saying like, oh gosh, actually we ended the Barristan chapter thinking everything was so great for him. And now we're seeing that perhaps it's not so great. We're shifting, we're shifting the narrative that, actually that there's no there's no going back in and so stomach told him soon enough and now it was time to change his bandages maester kedry would have told him as much this is kind of the first clue that it's quentin with saying that it's maester kedry he limped in from the parapet went on the maester's bed between a wine skin and a jar of ointment this wine skin is going to come back we kind of get this idea that that um quentin is becoming kind of addicted to uh opium um, and so this jar of ointment, which is, uh, an important thing later. Um, and then gingerly on direct his silken strips. And then we get the kind of this, uh, description of his burns. We wanted him to be burned enough that he was hurting, but not burned enough that he was dying. You know, we want some sort of cost for what he did, but at the same time, we don't want to kill him off. So... Um, we have to describe these burns and then he just kind of generally says that damned whip. Um, we don't want to over explain things. People can kind of figure out that like it was, it was the whip that was on fire and the, and the oil and the whip, um, without over explaining it too much. Um, his fingers looked like sausages. It was useless to him, um, bringing him nothing but agony. This is very, this is very, um, uh, I mean, obviously it's very Jamie, but it's also very Theon with the, with their, with their hands being nothing but pain and, and being the source of their sin and things like this. Um, if, if, if your hand offends thee, cut it off biblical kind of stuff. Um, 
so then but then we get to his left hand so you know just like jamie he can he can use his left hand so it uncorks the skin and we get this description of of um of him loving the uh the poppy juice and thinking of his father who also drinks poppy juice um, parisly so and then uh when the skin was going to drain he moved on to his legs and then um you know, being George, we wanted to make it a little, a little risque. So we get the talk of him um, dealing with his burned penis and needing him needing to forget desire, which is getting back into his newfound faith. Um, before it was, you know, because because you know uh, penises grow and and during nighttime. It was about it was about that like during night during his rest he would, he would it would break open but I guess it worked it works a little better here with you know relating it back to him like trying to forget desire and being pure um and then you know then we get to the description of like this is just all kind of very logical stuff like if he were burned where would he be burned obviously if he's wearing that mask he's gonna get burned on the neck and everything um so he found this hand mirror. Mirrors are actually pretty are pretty rarely um, talked about in Ice and Fire, despite despite like the mirror shield and things like that. But there are mirrors, but they're not talked about much. Um, the monkey mask um, shielded his face from the scalding oil. So you can kind of, if you can put it together, the scalding oil and the whip, um, you can figure out like that it was the, that that had caught on fire and was on him, not not actually dragon fire um so he has this red mess crept up his ears and cheeks on top of his hairless head uh never been a handsome boy and now he's a freak and so then we get this uh no maiden no maiden dreams of a kiss from a burnt man obviously this is a joke about sansa having having rec thinking that the that the hound kissed her when she when he didn't and so for the rest of his life um People would turn from sight, the sight of him, pity and disgust, which is is what he did at Astapor. He was just shocked by everything that we saw there. Um, so bringing it back to his guilt, his guilt about Astapor as well. But he is alive, and he 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 has no corruption. And this is this is um, he's thanking the ointment um, now. The medicine he's called was, har was called Harpy's Bomb. In one of the contributions, people have mentioned um, they, they think they named it Harpy's Gold, but I thought Harpy's Bomb was a was a a better kind of name. It turns out there is a scene in A Dance with Dragons where Tyrion, after a whipping, is given a ointment to put on his back that stings really, really bad. And so this th this idea that there would be a that there would be a, a healing ointment. Um, for for Quentin to use is not from it's 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 not from nowhere. Like you know that like Tyrion does have this ointment that he uses, um, and it does burn. Obviously, it's not named or anything like that. I, um, let me um bring that quote up really really quick. Yeah, he says, um, afterwards, another slave spread a stinging ointment across the cuts on his back to keep them from mortifying, then covered them with a cool poultice. And so, uh, <clears throat> I think in previous, pre in other people's, um, chapters that they submitted, people did describe different poultices and stuff, but, um just keep things kind of simple. We just kind of had the ointment. And so, you know, we'll bring back Kedri again with this, you know, uh, why this ointment exists. Um, and a, you know, a scarred warm, warm, woman is worth little as a bed warmer. Makes your Kedri a dead one even less. Or perhaps the stuff serves as another round of whipping. My penance, you know, because he does feel guilty about all of this. Um, and then uh, once he was covered with his burns, he reaches for the Arak. And so he all of a sudden has this Valyrian steel Arak, which um, 
seems like a, a cool thing for, for Quentin to have. I mean, the introduction of it with Kago, uh, you did, it was it was just one of those items where you're like, well, let's let's have that thing around because we don't we don't want to lose that thing from our story. So Ka, uh, Quentin picked it up and he's been cutting strips of bandages with it. Um, and then in the end, he he looked like a dead Gascari king ready to weigh his heart on the harpy scale. This is kind of this funny thing um, that that uh, came to us that he is. He is inside a pyramid and he's wrapping himself with bandages. So he, of course, looks like a mummy. And so he he is a dead Gascari king. He is a mummy ready to weigh his heart on the harpy scale. In in Egyptian mythology, um, your heart, the heart is weighed is, is weighed by, um, I think it's I think it's um, Aten, but. I forget who. It doesn't really matter, but like your heart, the heart is weighed in the afterlife. In the afterlife, the mummy, you know, after the, for the mummification of the pharaoh. And then we get um, the jar of bomb discussion. Of course, you know, it's like oh, they have so much of it. And the storeroom had hundreds of crates, so the, he's concluding that the men of Ahles were were very cruel because they used so much of it. Um, and then we get this very very George description where we start talking about cataloging all of the food and all of the stuff that he's finding in there this is pretty common kind of stuff so um so as long as the looters kept away he had everything he needed the cistern with brain water free from the pale mare um somebody asked how um quentin knew that the water was free from the pale mare and i want to say that um i'd looked up the pale mare before and there is i want to say like clean drinking water um is not is kind of inconsistently shown that like that some some characters know that you need to that you need to drink clean water and others don't and um and i wondered if uh, i forgot where it was but i want to say that there's something about that about like clean water and some characters knowing that clean water is important and others, yeah. Um, yeah, so for instance, the um, Scar, um, Tyrion screams to Scar, he says, the noble Yezin is in need of fresh, clean water. Um, Penny says, we have to get back. The master needs clean water. So it's not that they don't know about clean water and the idea. This, this um, In Westeros, they actually have like medical and um, knowledge that's way, way advanced for even the Renaissance. Like they're, they, they, they understand that little bugs live in water. Um, at least some of the characters do. So... Uh, Quentin would know that the rainwater should be free of the pale mare if he's a smart, educated person. Even though, even if during the Middle Ages, they perhaps wouldn't know that, <laughs> you know. So, uh, in Westeros, they do. So, I, you know. Anyway, the wine cellar is bursting with vintages from Arbor Carth and even ET. Uh, he could dress himself in the finest silks. He had no servants. He's living like a noble. And then we get this um, this description. Of, of food this is largely in parallel to john at the wall and his description of how much food they have but it's kind of this irony that like quentin is sitting here with all of this food and um you know people like at like stannis's camp are starving and things like that or at west at, at winterfell they're starving and here he's got all this food all to himself um and keep in mind that in in a dance with dragons danny does uh, forbid the wise ma uh, the the great masters from taking their money and wealth and food to their summer homes in the hills 
Um, and so the stuff should be there, logically speaking. Um, so he finds now a lot of this food um, and and what 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 was chosen. Some of this stuff is not actually even described uh, in Westeros, but the idea is that these are more Middle Eastern foods and what the what medieval people would have. So the idea is he has barrels of chickpeas and millet and beans. And then there's shelves crowded with vegetables, eggplants and mushrooms, leeks and garlic, onions and okra. Um, the idea is we're, we're picking more, more Middle Eastern and African foods than, than European foods here. Another had olives and olive oil, pomelos and pomelo vinegar. Pomelos, um, pomelos are interesting. Turns out, you know, uh, in olden times, they didn't have grapefruits. They had pomelos. Pomelos, grapefruits are a cross between, I think, pomelos and oranges. Um, so, and vinegar did come, they did have pomelo vinegar and fish and fish sauce, um, fish sauce, you know, that's being more of you know, kind of an Eastern idea, uh, fish sauce, um, Chinese, but you know, the idea is olive, olive oil, pomelo, pomelo, vinegar, finish fish, fish sauce. And then we get our pickled, pickled beets, pickled parsnip, pickled turnips, salt, mutton, salt, goat, salt, dog, dried squid, dried eel, dried herring, camel lard, you know, and we're getting our kind of Middle East kind of things. Lamb kidneys, very Middle East. Uh, dog sausages, very marine. Um, grapes and prunes and figs and pistachios, butter, cheese, you know, truly hungry. Pots of, un and this is where we start getting to um, the gross out stuff. We get the unborn hedgehogs. Hedgehogs being a Middle Eastern animal. And then the idea that they'd be eating these unborn hedgehogs to just be, I think the unborn dogs are, are, are mentioned in the story, but unborn hedgehogs would be just as kind of gross, from, uh, just as bad as the fermented grubs. And then we get some of the spices as well, which are, you know, Middle Eastern as well. Cinnamon and sesame, mint and anise, poppy seeds and cardamom, a barrel, an entire barrel of saffron. And this barrel and the wealth of that and, and this idea, it's gonna, gonna kind of come in a little bit later. Some of the ideas that Quentin has about his future um, might, are gonna come in later. Um, but yeah, a barrel of saffron, it's just a massive amount of wealth. And so he didn't, didn't take, he, he, he um, hadn't taken an inventory, but the, uh, the spices alone, he could buy a ship, hire a crew, live out the rest of his days. Um, and then we get some some interesting ideas: leather tomes from a shy, Valyrian tapestries, porcelain from Lung. Don't know, you know. I don't know if um, I just wanted to introduce that. Leave this possibility. We're not sure if these leather tomes from a shy are going to be useful. Maybe if there's there's something interesting, they might come back. Of course, you know, am I a thief? Well, of course, it's ridiculous because he's tried to. The proof is written all over his body because obviously he's trying to steal the dragons. Um, and then the treasures of Ahlaz were his now, he decided, um, but not for him. He was going to use them to, uh, rescue his friends. Again, we, we don't even hear about who these friends are, but they're in a dark cell as hostages for the dragon queen turned West. Um, and he says, he's rescue them, but how not Duskendale. He's not Duskendale and he's no Sir Barris Barristan. Still thinking about Sir Barristan a lot here. Um, but he realizes he can't be like Sir Barristan, so he's going to think about uh, the exact opposite of Barristan Selmy, which would probably be Oberyn Martell, which is quite fitting for, for Quentin to be thinking about his uncle. How would the Red Viper do it? And he says, with an army, with the scum, scum of the earth. A little, a little another, another reference. I mean, we know that, that um, Oberyn formed his own sellsword company, and we know, you know, which is why I think the Brave Companions were, were his. Um, and so he thinks about forming his own sellsword company. And so he kind of like logically speak, a lot of this is just logically speaking, like, what would you, what would you think? Well, he's got, he's got plenty of armor in the armory. He's got moonstones that he can pry from the bedpost. He could, he could go to Zahrina, who is the old woman from the, the bar in, in the Spurn Suter chapter, um, if, if the crone still lived. But then you kind of get a little Quentin in here because he's like, oh, I would need 200, but then a lot of people would die. Uh, you know, Quentin's not a bad guy. He feels guilty about stuff. So mayhaps it can be bloodless. And so then he starts thinking about bribing. 
bribing uh, the brazen beasts. Okay, and then um, next we have the the dragon returning. Um, Vis Viserion does the with the pyramid shaking with Viserion leaving. Um, this actually uh, this um, this is an event that actually happens in in the second Tyrion chapter. Viserion leaves at some point, and then he um, while well, Rhaegal is still out, is still out there. So the idea is that. We can kind of line this up with the la the latter half of um, Tyrion's chapter, so maybe this isn't as as far as noon, but it's still sometime in the in the late morning, uh, or you know. Um, so Viserion Viserion has returned. We we saw him leave in the in the Tyrion uh, sample chapter, Tyrion two, and so <clears throat> then we have the you know typical stuff you know with vase crashing and stuff like that. But this idea that there's this crack in the um in the ceiling as this uh big sort of like uh potential danger um i think somebody somebody mentioned oh it's like a sort of damocles yes it's like a sort of damocles like um where he feels like at any moment the the uh the roof could come down on him and he says you know welcome home um and so here, you know, we find out that Viserion has has made his lair on the upper floors. This is actually what Viserion has done. He has made his lair on the upper uh, upper floors of the um, of the Pyramid of Ullas. Um while Rhaegal had first made his in the Pyramid of Hazkar, and then had to move because that that pyramid collapsed. So um, Quentin thinks about that danger. Um, as he's seen the, the pyramid of Hazkar collapse from his from his parapet. Um, so how many collapsed under Regal's weight? Hundreds. Viserion was as big as brother or near enough. Uh, he tried not to think about the crack in the ceiling. And then we get the repeat of like mother have mercy that we had in the beginning. Comes back here. And this brings him into the flashback. Um, and a lot of this is flashback. I, I, I realize we've kind of taken the, uh, the George R. R. Martin style of putting everything in the starting people in the beginning of action and then going back uh, uh, quite to heart with a lot of these chapters where, where they're in the thick of things and then they think back. Um, and so this is a big one, of course, like trying to explain finally what happened to Quentin. Um, obviously the Quentin, uh, the dragon tamer chapter cuts off. And then, um, and then when we get to the Barristan chapters and we have an interview with Arch his conversation is also cut off before he can really explain what happened. And so now we finally, on the third chance, come come around and and hear um, what goes on. Though it's still a lot, you know, it's very ambiguous. We, we still leave a lot of holes because George doesn't like explaining things fully. So um, he had... He had the same prayer in the dragon's pit, then darkness all at once. The big man had knocked him to the floor and smothered him. Uh, we know that that does happen. Um, we know that Arch has burns on his hands from trying to smother um, someone. And um, so we know that at least that happened. And so under the cloak, he writhed and screamed as if he'd been a fire. And then, and then we get into like trying to make this as beautiful and sad as possible. Um, what seemed like an age, he knew nothing but darkness and the pain and the song. Uh, the idea is that the song is him screaming. It was a terrible thing, that song, hoarse and harsh and dissonant. Before he was like more high and shrill, it was more obviously a, a scream. We dialed it back where it's not quite, you're not quite sure what the song is. But the song is, you know, his original idea is that the song is, his, is, is him screaming. The savage refrain filled his heart with pity. It was an old song about a boy who hadn't survived his grand adventure. Grand adventure is the, the term that they, Quentin... Uh, uses to um, refer to his his trip. He taught, he calls it a grand adventure. The boy who had, who hadn't come back home, and this is the boy who hadn't come back home is more um, uh, connection to the idea about the boy who got sent off to war and doesn't come back home, which is you know the big theme of the of the Quentin chapters that you know he's he's a, a dutiful boy who's sent off to war, um, and then we get like a boy whose deeds, when counted, 
were slight and meager. And this is elements of Jamie um, when he is thinking about his life with the with the white book. He 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 thinks, oh, when when um when his his uh, uh, life is all counted by by uh, Barristan that it was you know a, a mingy thing. Um, and so he says it's a sad song, uh, an ugly song, a song of failure. He had failed him, his people, his friends, his father. And this is the big juxtaposition, right? There's a lot of juxtaposition about mother versus father here. And we're going to get, you know, we get into some really sad, sad stuff that we're putting in about Quentin's, um, you know, life. And, you know, there, there's this ambiguity about whether he's talking about his father or he's talking about the father. And there's a lot of discussion about whether he's talking about his mother or whether he's talking about the mother. Um, and so uh, these 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 ideas get conflated a, a, around, you know, a bit. Like when he was praying to the mother, you know, who is he really praying to? Um, and so all that was left to was to weep to, for that boar, that burned boy, which is a little meta. Um, because, you know, everybody's like, oh, isn't the Quentin story a, a sad one? And and it's like screaming, he waited to die. And here we get more kind of meta. And yet he didn't. <laughs> you know, his screams were met by others. And then we get kind of a few things. More meat, the, the big chain, the, ba- the, the big chain, the big one. The shattered chains being uh, something that's mentioned quite a bit in, in Arch's recollection of the story. He focuses on the chains. They heard metal shattering, crossbows thumping, beasts roaring, men howling. Uh, and then there was nothing but his heavy breasts and the sounds of dragons. And then and we decided to come up with this little sad little tale here. Um, he wanted nothing more than to st- uh, stay under that cloak. When he was young, um, his mother had his blanket embro- embroidered, glyphs of Norvos, she had told him, an enchantment to ward off monsters. Before it was just... Um, she she told him that she'd cast a spell, but then it was actually like an uh, I was trying to not use the word spell so much, and so then it became enchantment, and then enchantment was like, well, it needs to be enchant. When when you say enchantment, you think of the glyphs on on the um, on the dragon horn, the glyphs, you know, the the horn en- enchanted with glyphs of Valyria. So I was like, oh, well, let's change let's change that to the glyphs of Old Norvos, and Old Norvos is actually. Um, at least according to the world of ice and fire, uh, a civilization that no one really knows much about. It's not Roynish. It's not Valyrian. I'm not really sure what it was. So it makes it even more mysterious that, that, that his mother being Norvashi would uh, embroider these glyphs of old Norvos on his blanket. And, um, and then he's foolish enough to, uh, to take comfort in such a thing. And then you find out that Lord Anders had told him as much shortly after he arrived at Ironwood. He would not be getting the blanket back so as to learn his lesson. Spells were lies for children. Only prayers protect us. Which, it's it, one, it's it's a sad thing because we're now focusing on how young Quentin was when he went off to Ironwood. And what a sad day that is for him, you know, to be stripped of. His mother is leaving, you know, um, go, you know, going back to Esos, going back to Norvos. And he's taken from his father and he's, he's given to Lord Anders who... Um, we can just kind of tell as a colder, colder human being. Um, it's a, it's, it's really a quite a, quite a sad story for Quentin. But then there's this irony of spells relies for children, only prayers protect us. That like the, the irony, it's kind of the, the irony of, of, you know, in real life, if somebody made this joke, like, um, you know, that's, well, that's magic. I don't believe in magic, but I, but I believe in prayer. You're like, well, <laughs> you know, prayer is just is just magic for, from a god, right? Um, and in this in this case, it's kind of funny because we kind of know that the gods don't have any powers in um, in the world of ice and fire. Uh, at least, it doesn't seem like the faith of the seven has any power. I mean, maybe you can make arguments about Relor or something, but or or the old gods, but you know. The fact that he's like, there's no magic in the world. There's only prayer, but it's actually kind of reversed that, you know, we have, we might have things like, you know, skin changing and telekinesis and, 
and shadow babies, but we, uh, you know, prayer is actually probably nothing. Well, I mean, it's a prayer to the old gods, I suppose. So, you know, so, um, you know, or whatever prayer is, is prayer just telekinesis or just telepathy? Um, so he pl pulled the cook aside and he prayed and then we get the mercy, um, you know, kind of a rule of three. We're going to have three, three uh, paragraphs with mercy. And so we have the dragons were feasting. Um, I, I was amazed how many people, people were sad about the death of pretty Maris here. They're like, oh no, pretty Maris, like done dirty. She's just killed. Um, so pretty Maris is, is, is eaten, slurped up. Um, Kago uh, has to die in a different way. That's just as gruesome, but you know, and then, and then we have the other three bodies, you know, counted the, the, the wind blown. So we kind of know how many are around here. And then, um, and then uh, this imagery of masks, weeping tears of bronze. And then we have the, fr the, the friends were alive, huddled in the corner, eyes locked on the dragon. One of the windblown was with them, but burned, already dying. His mask was lost, revealing an old and frightened face. This, the idea is that this is the the um, the tattered prince. Um, in the Dragon Tamer chapter, chapter um, Quentin asks Pretty Maris, "Hey, I thought I thought the tattered prince was supposed to come with you guys," and she's like, "Oh, he's nearby." He's with, uh, he's got his own like army nearby, but the idea of people, fans have speculated that, okay, what, what's maybe he's one of the masked, um, windblown that, that that's with them, you know, if he really wanted to be part of it, um, cause he seemed to have wanted to be part of it and then he, he and he wants to be kind of secretive, you know, um, and that was the whole thing. There, there's this idea when he when they talk about his cloak, he's like, "Oh, I can take, just take off my cloak anytime and be a normal dude." And this is the the kind of idea that he's taken off his cloak to to blend in. Um, anyway, so mercy. The dragons uh, work their way through the corpses, um, cracking through the marrow, prodding tongues. We just got like to get a lot of imagery here, and then. Um, Spear of Fire cooked the pile at once, and then the brothers began their second helping. Uh, second helping is a is a short story by George R. R. Martin uh, in in Tough Voyaging, but uh, it was just nice to put in put in the the term second helping. Um, smoke rose from the lambs, adding an aroma of burnt meat to the sulfur air. He coughed, and Viserion's gaze met his. He could not look away, and so then we get into the more. Uh, more weird stuff. Is this Quentin's imagination? Um, is he actually connecting with a dragon? What's going on here? Um, is it the gods? Quentin, the dragon seemed to murmur, Quentin, and then he thinks, mother, she hasn't forgotten me. And there's ambiguity about who, which mother he's talking about, his own mother or, or um, the mother. Um, because obviously the story with the blanket is introduced, you know, the mother, her, his mother, uh, she's watching and he says, let me live mother, please mother, mother have mercy. You know, he wants it to be, he has a croaking whisper cause he's, he's frog and, um, his features moved to weep, but there, but there were no, the tear, his eyes were too dry for tears. And there's a puff that said like Doran, she knows my failure. And this is the thing is I wanted to be a good son. I did. I wanted to be proud of uh, one you'd be proud of, a son of Dorne. I'm sorry. I'm so very sorry. And you kind of you kind of think that like, you know, is he talking about his mother or the mother? And you realize that you know, although Quentin went off to be a dutiful son for his father, you know, he may have all. You got to we're revealing here that he also went off to be a good son for his mother. You know, so um, Quentin, no. Uh, and then we just, you know, we're getting to some kind of ambiguity of just like all of a sudden he's, he's walking towards this dragon and he doesn't really know why, um, picks up Kago's Arak, Viserion is kind of laid down and because, you know, he's, Viserion's all full, you know, we're kind of in a situation where net, where, where he's like nettles, he's nettling, the dragon has been nettled. So you don't know if like Quentin is really bonding with the dragon or if he's just getting on the dragon because the dragon is is full and and you know we'll accept we'll accept him and then 
you know, we're not explaining everything. Everything's kind of going fast at this point. And they go back the way he came because they're in a labyrinth. He's calling out left and right. This was the one of the big, big problems with the Quentin is dead idea is how did the wind blow him get out of the pyramid when it's specifically said to be a labyrinth. Um, and then they made it back to the entrance. Um, ambiguous if they're talking about the, the, the side entrance that they went in or if they are talking about the front entrance, but the white wings unfolded. And then like a half remembered dream, um, and then it's like, well, there's wind and rain and fear. It's because it's raining. It's raining the night that the the coup happens, and I mean the dragon taming happens. And so he gets back to why do I live? Why me? Um, and this is common. Uh, he thinks about the deaths of of his previous companions before Cletus, Maester Kedri, and Willem. Um, you know, it's funny these 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 three guys that that died off screen have such a an important role in the Quentin story. Um, even though we know, we know nothing, hardly anything about them. And then he says, where's the justice? So now we're, we're getting, we're wrapping it. We're bringing it back into the Dornish story on the, on the whole justice, because this is, this is Oberyn's original idea. When he arrives in King's Landing, he wants justice. The Dornish story is about justice and, um, justice and vengeance. And so, you know, we're bringing, we're bringing, wrapping it all in like what where is the justice um and he kind of thinks that you know a fiery death would be what he deserved or that in the seven hells and then he talks about the father's judgment and of course there was this ambiguity of like his father versus versus his mother right his father seems to be obsessed with vengeance but he's talking about justice here and so we're we're Justice versus vengeance is something that's talked about quite a bit. The, well, I'd say quite a bit, but here and there, now and again in Ice and Fire. And so um, this is kind of a movement, you know, Quentin is moving from the idea of, of from, from his father to his mother, essentially. He's, he's, he's going from the father's judgment to the mother's mercy um, is, the, is the journey here. Um, and so he looks up at the ointment. And I just kind of made up this line because I thought it would, I thought it would um, sound religious. When I was, when I was younger, I remember walking by a church, and the sign out front said, "Is there no balm in Gilead?" And I always like that stuck in me, like that that term balm. And so I, I came up with this phrase that I thought sounded religious. There is no greater bomb than the gods' forbearance, you know. Um, forbearance is when they withhold, um, withhold uh, um, uh, punishment, you know. Um, and so, um, when you kind of like tolerate something, so this is really, you know, it's like it's kind of their mercy, right? That's the no great, the greatest bomb. And then it's like, these were the words of the seven-pointed star, or perhaps it was the Book of Holy Prayer. The Book of Holy Prayer is the other book. It's mentioned by Circe in the Circe chapters. But um, it's, uh, regardless, uh, he knew he was alive only by the mother's will, only by her mercy. She stayed her husband's hand, tempered his wrath. She saved him, carried him away, delivered him again. And keep in mind, this is a, this is a big theme for George R. R. Martin. George R. R. Martin is a, his feminism is, is interesting because, when most of us think about feminism, we, we, we go to this idea of equality, but George R. R. Martin's feminism is more like, is more like, uh, maybe the way men is, men are doing it is completely wrong and we should just do things the way women do it, you know, which is, which is, um, uh, you know, which is, which is a, a rare thing that you see in, in, uh, entertainment or, or, or literature, that you know, we should just men should just drop the way they're doing things and do things the way women do it. Um, and so he, uh, this is kind of we're, we're we're getting into this kind of idea that that Quentin is is rejecting the ideas of the father and is accepting the ideas of the mother. You know, um, she saved him, carried him, delivered him again. This is the idea of him being reborn. Um, Reborn, reborn of fire, right? Now we're getting, now we're getting to prophecy. Um, 
And here I am, a babe anew, hairless beneath my swaddling clothes. All of his hair has been burned off. This is much like Danny. All of her hair is burned off when she came out of the pyre. That kind of stuff. And now he's in swaddling clothes. His his uh, his um, mummification uh, um, things. And so what you have is the prince reborn. We're getting this this little. This is some some little references, you know, prince with that was promised kind of stuff. Not not that you know. Um, not that there's, there's necessarily too much future of, of, of Quentin being Azora high or something, but these are, these are just like, you know, uh, fun little things to put in there that, uh, to, to confuse the reader and, and, um, you know, get their mind thinking. And then <clears throat> a second life of prayer and fasting. This was one of the, one of the editors put this in. It's like, no, we need to have second life. This is the whole idea. This is, this is getting to Veramir six skins and, and, and John, like having a second life. Um, they're reborn, right? Just like, just like, you know, and having a second life, um, in the, in their animal or whatever, you know, it's, uh, so Quentin is having a second life. And then she says, you know, why provide him with food? Humility as a begging brother, then why the wealth? In old days, the this is in old days the pious knights might join the warrior's son, but that order was long forgotten. Now that's a little joke because obviously the warrior sons is back because of Cersei, but Quentin would have no idea about that. There's a lot of things Quentin knows no idea about. Quentin has no idea that Oberyn's dead. You know that's the fun. You know, like he's so behind being off. You know, he's he's been he's been traveling this entire story, doesn't even know that Oberyn's dead. Um, and so, or Tywin or any of that. In days of old, a pious knight. Okay, um, where was the place for him? And then we kind of, I knew I wanted to mention Arianne. So this is where we kind of get the Baylor of the Blessed to come in. And it, it works well, the transition, because he starts thinking about, you know, his new life in Baylor of the Blessed um, and how his, he doesn't want to be like him. And one of his darker deeds was to imprison his sister. And then that just makes him think of Ariana, how funny that would be for Ariana to be imprisoned because she wouldn't abide it. Of course, Ariana was imprisoned in her tower. So this is kind of the funny thing. And she couldn't abide it, though. Um, and she does try to make a cunning escape uh, and, and fails. But um, no doubt aided by Sir Andre Dalton and Silva Santigar. Um, you know, we, we discussed the editors. We discussed... Uh, how much would Quentin know about Dre and Silva and kind of this idea that, well, he would have heard rumors that she's friends with these people, but she not, might not call him Dre, you know, so he would, he would probably refer to him as like the, his full title, Sir Andre Dalt and Silva Santigar, or perhaps the Sand Snakes. That was the way she would submit to nothing and no one, respecting only the bonds of friendship, which transitions back to Quentin, you know, and his idea of friendship. And um, and so this brings us to him thinking about urchin drink um, and how that now their their fate is so bound and there will be their threads forever entangled. Uh, and this is kind of um, one of those uh, when, it, when a character thinks about the future, it never happens. I think that Quentin may not at least in the in the short term, be reunited with with Arch and Drink, even though he clearly wants to be and thinks that they're entangled. The idea is that like they will, that him thinking like, oh, we've got to get back together, and then them not being together be is kind of the the subversion here. So I you know I think the future the night for a while at least Quentin will not be with his friends, and so he you know he would not flee Marine without them. Oh, really? You know, like, where, where are we going to see him next? Um, and a lot of this is about him. Like, there's so much of him, like, thinking about, oh, I need to free them from their cell. They're not even in the cell, you know? Like, oh, his thoughts are, the protagonist is always wrong in, in uh, Ice and Fire. Um, all right. I will, I will finish this up later um, and uh, continue on later. Okay. Thanks for watching. See you next time.